book of Psalms, chapter number uh, 16. Psalms, chapter number 16. Uh, can you get that from my wife? She took my sermon. He's like the old school Pentecostals extemporaneously. Yeah. Uh, Psalm chapter number 16, that's where we're going to head. Uh, this is uh, one of two part uh, series we're going to be preaching on uh, being better with God. And there's this whole premise that we want to uh, lift up, test, and even articulate. And part of what we believe is critically important is for us as a community of people, thank you, uh, us as a community of people to. Uh, remind ourselves that we are called to live in community one with another and that even sometimes living in community with folk is hard especially when you uh, are around folk that you may not naturally like or you may not be the likable one <laughs> none of us think that's us uh, but sometimes it is and uh, even then it causes us to, I think, be blessed by this mandate that we have from God to live in community. Uh, this particular passage is part of the lectionary post-Easter resurrection uh, a pericope, and it, I think, gives you and I a very interesting framework to appreciate how being in close relationship and proximity with God uh, bleeds over and spilled over into the kind of quality of relationships we should and could have with one another. Uh, so turn uh, with me, Psalms chapter number 16. Uh, I have the message uh, translation up on the screen. I think it was read earlier in our hearing. Uh, I will uh, uh, read the New Revised Standard Version uh, just in the interest of continuing to lift up different ways to talk about this, and we may have a different version as well, but all of these, I think, communicate some very timeless and eternal principles that I believe will accentuate why it is that we are better with God. Verse number 16 says, protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. And those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. Verse number 5 says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. And the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul Rejoices, my body also rests secure. For you do not abandon me to hell or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures evermore. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we will spend uh, the next few moments speaking from the topic simply uh, why are better with God. Amen. Why we are better with God. Pray with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let rest upon me and even the hearers of this word in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm better with God. Say that. I'm, and give your neighbor a high five and tell them you're better with God. You're better with God. Now just do your hand like this and say, we are better with God. Don't do that. We are better with God. Yes. Did that just make you feel good? <laughs> now, the book of Psalms, a very wonderful collection of prayers, songs, wisdom. 
wisdom sayings and other poems that have been used by the faithful to help shape their communication with God. In our particular cultural orientation of prayer, we are often taught or raised to pray extemporaneously. Meaning, if someone says, leave me in a word of prayer, uh, very few of us go to say the Book of Common Prayer or the Book of Psalms and recite these prayers. Most of us in a Protestant kind of background, that is why it is very, how I many of y'all get nervous sometimes when people ask you to pray? Amen. Nobody? Nobody? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Not lying to church on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Right? Someone asks you to pray and also you start sweating like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what I'm going to say, it's, it's the best when we're in our leadership meetings here at the church, right? We get ready to close, you know, it's the leaders of the church, we get ready to close our, so who would like to close the word of prayer, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> the leaders of this one. You know, kind of like in class, you got to call on somebody, close the word of prayer, like, Okay. Right. Why? Because there seems to be pressure to have to think of a prayer on the spot. And I get that because prayer is communication with God. And when you think about it, you're actually talking to the creator of the universe. I mean, that could create some performance anxiety if you ever had any, right? It's like, oh, what will I say? What will I say? Well, in this way, the book of Psalms has been a very historical gift in the life of the church because in many ways it captures some of the prayers, songs, spiritual sayings that have been tested and tried and proven. And people have rehearsed them and said them regularly. So the book of Psalms, in many Respects often will say and pray things that we would not say or pray. How many of you know sometimes when you pray, you don't always tell God what's on your mind? Amen. Uh, it's a post Easter funk, amen, right? Uh huh. How many of you know when you're praying, sometimes you 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 don't want to like you know pray harsh things to God, so you'll pray nice things, you know, it's like. You're really upset with somebody, and in your heart of hearts, you kind of wish that God was squashed them like a bug. But instead, you're like, God, you know, have mercy on them. You're like, no, I just want them gone. Right? Well, you know, in the Psalms, you have certain prayers. David, and others will pray, Lord, wipe my enemies off the face of the earth. <laughs> Man, that's some kind of prayer, man. In this way, is why theologians often call the Psalms experience in search of theology. It is this idea that the Psalms often start at the ground of who we are as human beings and all our raw emotion, all the contradictions of who we are. Versus in the New Testament scriptures, if you will, it is more theology in search of experience. Whereas we acknowledge, certainly, as resurrected people, theologically that is quite a claim. Right? And then it's like, what does it mean for us to now live in light of this theological truth? Theology in search of experience in the New Testament but in the Psalms, experience in search of theology. How does my life measure or fulfill the truth of who God is? How do I make sense of what's going on in my life? This is a gift of the Psalms. But one of the great gifts I think we continue to find in the Psalms is that they always lead us back to God. Yeah. And my brother and my sister, part of what you and I must never underestimate is the benefit of being in relationship with God. How many of you know you're only as good as the relationships you're in? Yes. 
Right. I know a lot of us who are introverted type folk, and we 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 love to be by ourselves. Amen. It's just me, myself, and I. Anybody you know met folk like that? It's like I'm perfectly okay if you never talk to me. Yep. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> I mean, just, just leave me alone, right? You know, the world would be great if no one ever talked to me. But how? how uh, you, you are not constituted to be that way completely. Right. That we are in relational people. Right. Relationships are perhaps the most basic and necessary facet of our human existence. And when you take our lives and experiences as a whole, they are nothing but a series of relationships. We have relationships with human beings. We have relationships with structures and institutions. We have relationships with environment and animals. We have relationships with money and finances. Relationships are rudimentary, they're elementary, they're foundational to how we understand the world and see ourselves. Yeah. And as Christians, if we're to talk about relationships in general, we must first start with our relationship with God. Because your relationship with God must be the grounding for how you interact with other people. Even greater, I think it is important for us to examine how our relationship with God impacts our relationship in the world. Because it seems to me that if we're not in proper relationship with God, it is easier to be in wrong relationship with other people. Relationships with God must always be the preeminent relationship in our lives. Right. Mm. Did you hear me on that? Mm. Your relationship with God must take priority. Yeah. Now, be clear. Your relationship with God does not mean that you can just run into this cocoon with God. Because even if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus found a very interesting balance between retreat. So does not preclude or mean that being in a relational God means that you become a hermit, antisocial, no relational skills. Let me know some folk are more gifted than others in being relational. Yeah. Yeah. But you still got to figure out how to get along with somebody. <laughs> yeah, don't ever let nobody tell you, you know, this is the way I am. Well, that's, that, that's good. That's why you got to be born again. Somebody say amen, right? Yeah. <laughs> No uh, uh, composition or interaction within God's self. As Christians, we believe that God's self-revelation to the world is particular. I'll give you a little bit of theology because I think it's going to help us get a little bit further down the road here. The early church confessed the mystery of God through declarations and creeds. And we affirm those declarations and creeds. We affirm how God has revealed God's self to the church and in a historical Theological manner, we say that the God, the Christian God, exists eternally as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Trinity, the Godhead, some of these words that have been assigned to describe the composition and interrelationships of God. This is not to say that there are three gods or divine beings in heaven that exist independent from one another. Neither is it proper to see God as one of the three at a given time. But part of the ineffable mystery of God is that our God is one God. Everybody say that my God is one God. My God is one God. And eternally existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, every time we start talking about the Godhead, the Trinity, everybody starts to get real weird, funny. It's like, oh my goodness, that's what we're talking about. I mean, it sounds like you got a throne in heaven for the Father, a throne in heaven for the Son, a throne in heaven for the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that that is not the way God exists in eternity. God is one God. You may not always understand it, but how many of you know there's a whole lot of things you don't understand, but you still believe in? Right. Mm. How many of you understand how your car got you here this morning? No. You don't understand. How many of you understand why your heart keeps getting broken the same way over? Mm, you don't understand. We can't often explain 
explain things, but they are still true. But part of what I love about God is that God is always wanting to make God's self knowable to us. And the deeper you get in relationship with God, the more you find God being knowable to you. And in this way, it is better to be with God than to be without God. Because when you're with God, you get to know God more intimately than you would if you were on the periphery. to 
God. Yeah. Somebody holler, I am connected. <laughs> Come on, say it again. I am connected. I am connected. Now, understand, child of God, that there are great benefits to be connected to certain folks versus others. Amen. Some folk you don't want to be connected to. Amen. Some folk be like a anchor around your, you know, whatever, you know. I'm not the best child. <laughs> you, you, you know folk that you, you just they just a drag amen it's just amen. like you know they, they, they hold you back you trying to go higher and they keep pulling you you know it's, 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 it's like you know Michael Corleone in the Godfather 3 he was saying just when I thought I was out <laughs> pull me back in sometimes folk you connect to can pull you back stuff that you're trying to be free from. But when you're connected to God, how many of you know you are connected, the scripture says, to the source of all that is good. What a great, great blessing. To be connected to a source that never runs out of goodness. Amen. Now for not Choosing up a 
God. How many of you know one of the greatest sins of our country is idolatry? And we are constantly putting other things, people, before God. And when you put other gods before God, then you settle for what those gods can do for you. Right. Prophet always talked about idols. Say they have eyes, but they cannot see. That's what it's like. is 
is a combination of a person that has soft boundaries and rigid boundaries. And this person uh, is not always sure of what to let in and what to keep out. Spongy boundaries. Then you have a rigid boundary. And we all know what rigid boundaries are, right? We know people who have rigid boundaries, right? You know, there's people that have been hurt so many times. How many have seen a, a thin line between love and hate? Y'all remember that back in the day? Big Whitfield, that was That's just, <laughs> Rigid. Amen, amen. She ain't, ain't nobody gonna hurt me. When she looked at Martin and told him that, I said, bring with me, that's just alone. She rigid, dog. Oh! 
sociological take on the fragmentation of, of our culture and our people groups today, written by a wonderful brother by the name of Eugene Robinson, wrote this great book called Disintegration. And he talks about how uh, there was a time when there was this kind of uh, illusion, and I would say illusion because even in the midst of the thought of a monolith, how many of you know there's always a lot of diversity and nuance even in those things we think are the same? But there was a time, I think, when there were these assumptions about how folk usually were pretty similar. And he talks about it in a very fascinating way, how now the fragmentation of identity and class and culture have now created categories that often allow folk to think differently, largely about large, broad swaths of information and perspectives. And he talks about how there is this kind of transcendent category of people, people who are very wealthy and privileged. Uh, in many respects, sometimes they are invisible outside the purview of regular, normal folk. Because how many of you know there is some wealthy folk that you don't even will never see or know? Mm. He talks about the transcendent. Then he talks about the middle class or the mainstream. Folk who are kind of living in the middle between all of these cultural class distinctions. They're struggling to make it, but they are making it. And they have a certain kind of ethos among themselves that is shared. He talks then about a third category called the emergent, which is in many ways a commentary on the different uh, 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 immigrant and transitional uh, nation groups that are coming in and out of nation states all across the world, certainly even in this country. And how even these merging of different nations and nationalities are causing a different worldview. But then he has this fourth category that he talks about and it is called the abandoned. And he talks about this category in a way where it speaks to those generations of people that have been left out and excluded from opportunity and and, and, and belonging, people who are known. You know, some of us do this even in our family, right? We call them the black sheep of our family, right? It's like, oh, there go, you know, like, you know, he's the only one you don't invite to the family reunion. And then when you show up, you're like, oh, I told you. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? You, you know, you, you, got, you got Uncle Jack. <laughs> But could you imagine what it would feel like if God abandoned us, walked away from us time and time again because we were not good enough? As resurrected people, I believe one of our great mandates is to never abandon one another. Why? Not because we have goodness in our own self. Not because our boundaries are all that and some. But because we know that even those who we think are unredeemable, as resurrected people, God has the power to raise them from the dead. Anyone can point to your life a few times in your life and say, man, I was abandoned. I was left out there in my mind, in my heart, in my soul. But God found a way. Yes. Yes. Bring me back yes. into a right relationship with him. Sundays, but they, their church is alive. Because 
they don't want to be around. You saw the sister there. I don't do church people. Amen. So they, they, they hung up on that. Praise God. Mm, I got to come here for that another day. But guess what? That's their back door. The live group is their back door. Why? Because when you and I meet together, we can have better conversation. More intimacy. More relationship. We understand that I can't abandon you. If I know you, I'm going to have your back. You're going to have mine. We're going to walk this thing together. We thank God because he did not abandon our souls to him. But even at our lowest moment, he lifted us up. I believe you're better with God. I believe I'm better with God. I believe we're better with God. So let's get closer to God. Let's get closer to one another. Let's ask ourselves, Lord, am I really connected to you? Put these questions up here on the screen. We're gonna spend a few moments in prayer. What keeps you from being in relationship with God and other Christ followers? What is the barrier to your deep relational connection? There's some things, and this is all going to be different for a lot of us, but you got to spend some time thinking through it, confessing it, praying on it. God, what is these barriers? What boundaries have God set that you continually test? What are those places that God has put boundaries and you trying to go beyond those boundaries. You're trying to move beyond those boundaries. Uh, some, some of us need to live within the means that God has us. What are the boundaries that in our own lives we may need to cultivate? Maybe we're too soft and spongy and rigid. And God's looking for more flexibility. Last question I want to lift up is more of a celebratory testimonial question. What ways can you look back and thank God he has not abandoned you? I thank God that he did not give me up. Because I can remember some times when I was trying to run away from God. I remember some times I was trying to bail out on God, but God never bailed out on me. He didn't give up on me, but he kept me. He held me. Stay with me, everyone. Let's spend a few moments in prayer in this world.